Uh, so let's start out. Number 10, right off the gates. What is the common myth at number 10 that I often see? Well, antivirus. My antivirus is all I need to stay safe online. Well, there's a couple problems with this. One, an antivirus is usually just part of your robust system for a client. Uh, that's also your PC or your Mac but it really doesn't protect against everything. It's literally just looking for different malware. And part of the problem with this is that not all malware is detected by your antivirus program. One of the other prolonged myths of this is that a free version of an antivirus program is somehow going to uh, keep you safe. I want to point out one thing when it comes to free antivirus systems, okay? If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And that goes in line with free antivirus systems. The problem with an antivirus system as an all-in-one protection measure is that it doesn't protect against silly little things like zero-day exploits. Uh, a lot of times it misses a specific signature, which means that if we have a new malware that your, your antivirus program didn't pick up on, or if there's something that's brand new, usually with a zero-day exploit or something similar to that, and it's not up to date, it's going to miss it entirely, which means that your antivirus system really isn't keeping you very well protected in that kind of environment. One of the other big problems with an antivirus system is it doesn't protect against phishing emails, social engineering. A lot of the things that a antivirus program can do for you can easily be bypassed by you clicking on a link or going to a website that you're not supposed to go to and it does not provide an all-in-one silver bullet to protect you. Yes, it is something you should have. No, it is not going to protect you against everything. And so there's this overconfidence of what an antivirus system actually does. All right, that leads us to myth number nine on the list. I should say myth number two. Number nine on the list, uh, my network's too small. My business is too small. Uh, hackers aren't going to target me. I'm just a small business or I'm just a, a little peon in the bigger scheme of things. It's not really worth targeting me. I don't make enough money. Uh, this is probably a huge myth that needs to be debunked right out the gate. case. Cyber, cyber criminals. They often target smaller businesses because they're weaker in cybersecurity. They don't have the defensive structure in place. It's much harder to attack a bigger structure or a bigger enterprise environment because they have the, the resources, they have the, the capability to better protect their systems and networks, whereas a smaller business doesn't. I want you to think about this, right? If you're going after as much money, if you're going to throw net out there and see what sticks, why wouldn't I go for smaller businesses? Smaller businesses are much more numerous than larger businesses, and they usually can't pay for the higher end security. They usually don't have cybersecurity on staff. This means that regardless of how big or how small your business is, it's still going to be a target for attack. There's an old saying in cybersecurity of, it's not a matter of if you're going to get attacked, it's a matter of when you'll be attacked. And data theft, botnet recruitment, all of this comes into play with any size of business, whether it's just you by yourself, or a five-man operation, or even something that's got 500 people to, you know, thousands upon thousands of people. You are not too small to be targeted by attackers when it comes to your business. And that is one myth you just need to get out of your head right off the bat. It is important for you, even as a small business owner, or even as an individual, to understand that cybersecurity hackers, or I should say unethical hackers, malicious attackers, will 100% go after you. They're going to go after the easy target. That's what they want. They're lazy. They're 100% lazy, and so they're going to go after you whenever they can. All right, that leads us to our next big myth, public Wi-Fi systems. I love public Wi-Fi systems, said no cybersecurity professional ever. Uh, public Wi-Fi systems, a lot of people seem to think that, oh, it's safe, it's password protected. I go to Starbucks or I go to that local coffee shop, and it's got the Wi-Fi password is this, and so I know it's safe because it has a Wi-Fi password. 100% without a shadow of a doubt, the, the wrong answer. Uh, password protected Wi-Fi systems are vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. That's an attack where I can inject myself in the middle of your network and see what traffic is going from, well, from you over to any other system. Uh, I could also set up a rogue access point or a evil twin that will basically look like a free open public Wi-Fi system and grab all of your traffic. Even if it's encrypted, I can make your system believe that you're actually connected to that system with some handy dandy programming. We show students how to do this at the university all the time. And so keeping an open public Wi-Fi system on your phone or attaching to it in any way, shape or form, 100% a bad idea unless you're using VPN. And even then I'd be cautious because a VPN is not 100% protective of the system. Will it stop these types of attacks? Yes, it will. But I want you to be understanding of this VPNs are not a one-size-fits-all solution. If you buy your VPN from a no-named company over in China, 
chances are they can still look at your system and they probably are. And so if you are going to use a VPN, make sure it's from a reputable company. There's quite a few out there. Uh, and don't avoid sensitive information, right? Don't go to your bank on a public Wi-Fi system, even if you're using VPN. Don't hit some, some sensitive server that has important files on it with, with public data on it. Don't do that, right? If you're going to use public Wi-Fi system, first, use a VPN. Second, make sure you're only accessing the websites that you really don't, it, it doesn't have any sensitive information on there. We're not talking about banks, we're not talking about anything else like that, right? Uh, but definitely, I, I am a big proponent of not using public Wi-Fi systems. I think that's a bad idea. I think it's a horrible idea. Don't use public Wi-Fi. If you've got a mobile device, just go through your mobile carrier. Just go through your mobile carrier. That's that's my suggestion. All right, that leads us to number seven, strong passwords. Strong password is enough to secure my account. After all, I have a 32-bit character, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. I did everything I'm supposed to do. Of course, my account is secure. Nobody will break into that. Uh, this is 100% inaccurate, right? While strong passwords are essential for ensuring that your accounts are secure, they are not a one-size-fits-all implement, right? Just like anything else, it is possible to break those passwords. Now, you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, wait a second. You just said 32 characters, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. I did the whole gambit. My entire system is 100% secure. I know my password is unbreakable. Uh, is it? Because depending on where you put that password, I don't need to break the password. I just need to break into the organization that stores your password. And so we see a lot of password reuse. This is where somebody uses the same password across multiple websites. And that is a major problem. So how do I, how do I, well, protect this? Well, I use multi-factor authentication. When we add multi-factor authentication, or also known as two-factor authentication onto our, our, our systems, then we significantly strengthen the defenses, which means even though somebody may grab your password, even if it's a strong password, they have to send you a text or they have to go through this other process. It's a, another factor to get access into your system. A lot of times they will say, hey, did you, did you actually do this? Did you sign in from this new location? And if you didn't, that gives you an opportunity, gives you a heads up to change that password. But Strong password, not enough to secure your account by yourself. Always use multi-factor authentication. Always use two-factor authentication whenever given the option. Definitely something you should be utilizing. Uh, and so that myth, strong password's enough by itself. No, no, absolutely not. All right, that leads us to number six. It's too expensive. Cybersecurities are too costly for me to implement, even in a small business or by myself. That's, that's not true. It's actually very affordable in a lot of different cases. Now, we're not talking about hiring a five-man crew to do cybersecurity for your small business or for your personal environment all by itself, right? But there are things that you can do that would exponentially increase the security in your small business or even in your own personal lives, right? I want to point out that a lot of small businesses, they're like, oh, it's too expensive to, to hire a consult. It's too expensive to hire an IT guy. It's too expensive to do this, right? But if you picture it, the cost of a breach the financial loss, the reputational damage, the downtime for your networks for not hiring somebody with even minimal knowledge of cybersecurity is far exceeds the investment for basic security. Far exceeds it. And so if you're a small business, if you are a person that's that's doing a little bit of, of personal information, a little bit of data in that enterprise environment, 100% something I would invest in, even from a consult basis. Uh, and there's a lot of companies out there that will go in, they'll look at your, your systems, they'll look at your other stuff, uh, they're ethical, right? And you can hire them on to come on on a case-by-case -case basis, or even in some cases, you can grab them on a temporary basis where you're they're only charging you for you know, the hours they spent on your business. And sometimes that's a little bit more expensive on an hourly basis, but you can get somebody in there to look at your stuff and say, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And believe it or not, a lot of those are not technical measures. Yes, technical measures matter, and we want, we want to utilize multi-factor authentication. We want to use secure browsers. We want to implement some cost-effective uh, uh, security tools in there. But a lot of times, just educating your employees is a huge investment and it's minimal cost that will far and exceed a lot of what the technical tools do because 93%, 93% of all data breaches occur from human error. From human error, people doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And so if we could curtail that with some proper training, a lot of times we can lower that 93% in your business down to a more manageable rate. We still want to use technology, but let's start at the beginning. There's always room. There's always room in your budget for a little bit of cybersecurity, uh, whether it's an antivirus program, multi-factor authentication. Well, I, I feel like I'm beating this dead horse. Let's move on. Uh, myth number five on my list. I'll know immediately if I've been hacked. I know. I know what being hacked looks like. I've been hacked before. 
I know that I'm going to see a slowdown in my machines. There's going to be little cues in there. By God, I am one of those people that is zeroed in on my systems, and I know if I'll get hacked. Uh, this could not be less true if I tried to do it, right? Um, did you know there was a report out about, about six months ago where somebody had an attacker in their network for over six years? Over six years, somebody was in their network identifying points doing data exfiltration. And this was not a small company. This was a company that had major investments in cybersecurity. So no, you won't know if you've been hacked a lot of times. They can go weeks, they can go months, and in some cases, years before you know if you've actually been hacked. And this is a problem. We need to do regular monitoring, regular logger, uh, logging. We need to understand the alerts. We need to do early detection, and we need to do things like threat hunting. But you are not going to know immediately if you've been hacked. A lot of times you won't know, and especially if you're not actually doing anything about it, You'll probably never know. And an antivirus program, by the way, not going to tell you, not going to tell you. And so we need to invest a little bit into cybersecurity. Uh, and we need to understand that you are not going to know if you've been hacked. It's not going to happen. If a hacker is good or you've been semi-confident, chances are you won't know if you've been hacked. Will you know if you got a piece of malware? Sometimes. Will you know that, uh, that a piece of uh, virus has gotten into your system? Eh, sometimes. But for an attacker, for an experienced person that knows what they're doing, Probably not. Probably not going to be something you're going to be able to pick off right off the bat. All right. Next, number four on our myth list. My personal devices aren't at risk for cyber attacks. I mean, after all, they're personal devices. Who would target my personal cell phone or my personal computer? There's nothing really needed on there. What about your remote work? What about those emails you send off? When you look at your personal devices, it is far easier for a threat actor or somebody that's using uh, malicious software to get into a personal device than it is an enterprise level device. And yet, what do you do on those personal devices? Well, you go to your bank accounts, you go to Amazon, you go to these other websites and you punch in your credit card numbers. I can put a key logger on there if I'm a malicious actor. Uh, I can put spyware, ransomware, uh, viruses, Trojans, or, uh, rats, remote access Trojans. We can all go in there uh, if I was a malicious actor and jump into that and steal your information. And you may think to yourself, well, I really don't do that much on there, but what other devices on your network are you using, right? If I can get a, a foothold into one device that's attached to your network, that is just a spawn point. I can then pivot from there and attack other devices. And so we need to protect those devices. We need strong passwords. We need to patch on a regular basis. We need to have antivirus software on there whenever possible. And we need to take the proper precautions on our personal devices. If you notice something, then we need to fix it. And so personal devices 100% are capable of being attacked, regardless if it's a PC, a Mac, uh, a Linux system, a phone, it does not matter, even a tablet on your IoT devices. Yes, that smart fridge can also be attacked, that it can also be utilized as a pivot point for a skilled malicious actor. All right, that leads us to number three, my favorite myth, older software. Older software. If my software still works, there's no need to update it. After all, I've been using Windows 95 for the last 20 years. It's always worked before. I'm not going to update. It costs too much money. I hear these excuses all the time. The biggest one I, I like right now is Windows 7. Uh, there was a company that I consulted for. I'm not going to... Yeah, they're going to be renamed nameless. I consulted for them. Uh, they were still using Windows 7 as their POS system. That was how they, they got their money in. Uh, huge, huge problem. You can hack into a Windows 7 system. There's there's so many problems with the Windows 7 right now. It's ridiculous. And yet they were still using it, right? So older software, older operating systems, 100%, we need to update those. If it's reached, reached end of life, if it's no longer being supported by the vendor, it's time to get rid of it. It really is. And if your proprietary software won't work on those new software, then we need to spend the money to update that proprietary software. But older software, older software can 100% be attacked and it's a lot of times it's far easier to attack older software than it is newer software because older software does not encompass the new attack vectors that are available for us today and hackers regularly exploit them we only need to look at the WannaCry virus and that right off the bat tells you that people don't like patching uh for those who don't know uh the WannaCry virus came out six months after the patch for fixing that problem already existed and the WannaCry virus which is a ransomware it's one of the very first ransomware that came out had people just patch their systems it wouldn't have gone through. It wouldn't have gone through. And so we need to do regular updates. We need to look at our software and understand, is it needing to be upgraded, right? If the vendor no longer supports it, it's time to get rid of it, okay? All right, that leads us to number two on my top list of myths for cybersecurity. Social media accounts don't need additional security measures. After all, it's just social media. Facebook, 
Instagram, Twitter. Why do I need additional security measures for that? Well, believe it or not, social media attack vectors common for phishing, impersonation, and identity theft. How many times have you logged in with your Google or your Facebook or whatever and logged into additional websites from that block, from that Facebook account or whatnot, right? Think about that. If I have access to your social media account, I can log in to other websites and I can pretend to be you. I can now conduct identity theft. Uh, I can do a lot of different things with it. And so we want to use that multi-factor authentication. We want to limit what we share. Did you know there's there's a great guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he looks at social media posts and he can identify where they are just by taking a picture. I, I wish I had the guy's name, he's awesome, right? But take a picture and you can identify where you're at. There's a lot of things that people share on social media that just open a huge gate for OSINT, which is open source intelligence. And so through open source intelligence, I can usually figure out where you are, what you're into. For instance, look at my background. You probably realize I'm a little bit of a geek. That would be a great attack vector if I wasn't a cybersecurity expert. And even, even if I am, it's still a great attack vector, right? For social engineering, for those attacks that go against me, right? So we need to regularly review our privacy policies. We need to regularly review what we're doing on social media and make sure we're not sharing too much. Social media accounts, 100% something that you should be cognizant about uh, and understand the, the vulnerabilities with what you share online. Uh, and that goes for a variety of different instances, whether it's for employment or through other services. Make sure that you understand your social media 100% should be secure. You should definitely have multi-factor authentication on it and you should limit what you post. You should limit what you share. And that leads me to my number one myth, my favorite myth of all time. And maybe it's because I worked in the mobile industry for so long, but you may have guessed it. Mobile devices are secure by default. After all, after all, let's be honest here. My carrier takes care of me. My carrier loves me. I pay them every month for my phone. They're keeping my data safe. They're keeping my phone safe. This is 100% wrong. Mobile devices are often the target for their rich data. Did you know more people, especially the younger generation, uses their mobile devices for everyday activities, more so than their PCs or even their Macs? People love their mobile devices, and they somehow have this myth in their head that their carrier, or because it's a mobile device, it's somehow more secure, and that cannot be farther from the truth. As a matter of fact, mobile devices by nature are less secure than a PC or Mac. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's a mobile device. It has to do with the fact that the device itself's operating system is condensed. It has to do with the fact that you're using it for a lot of different things. And so we use those devices, including financial apps, emails, photos, what kind of applications you have on the device. We need to protect our mobile devices with strong passwords. We need to protect it with facial recognition when possible. We need to do some multi-factor authentication. We need to make sure that it's being updated regularly. We need to make sure those app permissions are under control. We, how many times have we downloaded an app and it just says, hey, I want access to all this stuff. Why does it need access to that? Why are you giving them access to your contacts? Why do that, right? And so we want to, we want to make sure that we're controlling the permissions for those applications on that mobile device. We also want to make sure that we have a good antivirus program on that mobile device and that we're using multi-factor authentication with that mobile device when it comes to certain applications, right? We want to avoid downloading applications from untrusted sources. Have you gone to a website and it's like, oh, well, you could pay for this, but I'll give it you for free over here. Listen, if you're getting an application for free and it's not on the store, and sometimes even if it is on the store, you're opening yourself up for attack. You really are. And so mobile devices, definitely not as secure as PCs or Macs. They're definitely not. And so you need to safeguard those mobile devices more so than what you do with your PC. And yet oftentimes we don't see that. Oftentimes people will buy an antivirus program for their PC or their Mac, and they completely ignore their mobile device. And that is probably the worst thing you could possibly do. All right, that's it for me today. That's my top 10 myths that we often see in cybersecurity, or I should say I often see in cybersecurity. Uh, what myths have you seen? What have you seen? After all, uh, I'd love to hear these stories. As always, my name is Dr. K. If you can hit that like, the subscribe button, I would deeply appreciate it. Well, until next time, we'll see you around.